Are we, do we have to stay in this area? Uh, pretty close. Okay. Uh, and now that's on recording. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, hello. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Led to Lead, Developing Teens. Um, my name is Keith O'Neill. I'm the uh, youth and college minister at Concord Road Church of Christ. And I'm Cody Perry. I am the children and family minister at Concord Road Church of Christ. And we are glad to be here just to kind of give you an idea of our roles because since we are two youth ministers at the same church. So I deal with kids from pretty much birth up to eighth grade. And then I help transition them. I do a lot of middle school events with the high school and middle school. And then I hand them off to Keith and he does ninth grade through college. So we actually work with families and kids from the time they're born until they graduate college, which is really, really cool. And uh, that, can, that can vary, right? Because sometimes they're in college for five, six. I got one going on nine years. Uh, but uh, it, it, every, time, every time Cody says I have them from birth until eighth grade, I always imagine Cody like catching them. You know, like <laughs> as they're coming out. That's, I mean, that's, uh, a, that's a pretty quick start. <laughs> but um, we're going to share a few things today. Uh, I think for most of you, nothing we say today will necessarily be new. Um, yeah, hopefully, it's, it's just some, some thoughts. I know sometimes as, as, as youth ministers or as parents uh, or as younger guys, as, as you're thinking about going into ministry, um, we don't always have the, the best track record or do a great job of discussing with one another. So sometimes it's just nice to hear some thoughts from somebody else uh, and, and share some thoughts. But we're going to share some things today that, that we think are important. And uh, there's, as, as we share this today, uh, there's, no, there's no right or wrong. There's no, you know, silver bullet. There's, there's no, because we're dealing with people. And people fail. We both fail. Um, you all fail. And sometimes, as, as, as kids grow, they make choices and they fail. Um, the, one of the hardest things for ministry for me is you can't make choices for people. At the same time, I don't want to make choices for people. You know, it's, it's that uh, you can't make those choices. All you can do is, whether you're a parent or you're a minister or you're a mentor, all you can do is try and stick to some things that uh, make sense and that work. And at the end of the day, uh, you let each and every person make their own choice. But that's the pattern we have from God. So I'm pretty confident in that pattern. Well, and I'll throw this out there too. If you're one of the young guys wanting to go into youth ministry, um, don't ever expect to go to a ministry conference. Don't ever expect to go to like a lectureship or a youth rally or talk to your favorite youth minister and expect to take their youth ministry, put it in a box and carry it back to your church and open the box and expect it to go the exact same way that it's going to go at your church the way that it did at theirs. Because in youth ministry, what you'll find is, is it is uh, most of the time, if not all of the time, um, it is completely unique to your kids, your parents, your people. Um, so this is my 10th year in ministry. I've been a preacher, I've been a youth minister, and now I'm working with little kids. And what I found is, is there are very few things that actually cross over from each work to the other works because they're very different dynamics in the different places that you'll be. So you can't take what Keith and I are doing, put it in a box, take it back to your home church and say, hey, I did this just like they did and it didn't work, so therefore it must not be effective. That's not how youth ministry works. Youth ministry is very specific to your church. Now, with that being said, the things that we're going to share with you are principles that you can use that will enhance the ministry that you build with your people and your personnel. Because that's the, that's the trick to youth ministry is youth ministry is not... Hey, here's the formula, like he said, it's not, there's no silver bullet. Rather, you are taking principles and putting it into play with the personnel that you have, and you are making a, an environment, a spiritual environment with your people that is catered to those people. So just be aware of that. Just because we tell you, hey, try this, it may work. It may work well. You may get to your church, and it may not apply to you. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, if I were to tell you to, hey, use parents at every youth event that you have as chaperones, and I use parents at every youth event that I chaperone. Well, what if you have horrible parents? And you say, hey, I'm going to bring all of my parents as chaperones. Y'all laugh, but I'll tell you a story. Uh, one time I had a young man that is a good friend of mine. He asked me, he said, hey, should I use parents as chaperones? I said, absolutely should. Uh, and I failed to tell him, like, make sure they're good parents. 
and one of his parents signed up to drive a van for him. What I didn't realize, and I thought maybe, I would just say that I would have never done this, the parent that volunteered to drive the bus had just been arrested for a DUI two weeks before. But he said, hey, I was supposed to use parents. And I was like, hey, you got to be a little more common sense with that. Use your people. So there's no one set answer. Youth ministry is adaptable to the personnel and people that you have. So these things are things that we will share with you that have worked for us, but it doesn't mean it's always going to work. You have to know your people. You have to know your, your resources. You have to know where you are so that you can know what's best for you. So first thing off the bat, we, we got a few things. First thing off the bat, uh, to communicate to parents, uh, if you are a parent or if, if you're a youth minister or minister and you're talking with your parents, you've got to ha have parents realize they need to be the examples they want their kids to be. Uh, you know, make, make sure parents, you are your kid's number one youth minister. Uh, don't abdicate authority. Don't, uh, you know, a lot of times you'll have parents who, you know, they say, oh, yeah, and drop their kids off, and then they don't even come. Or they say, oh, you're not, having, you're not having kids' classes tonight? Well, then I won't, you know, I won't come, or, you know, things like that. Um, you have to, when you're, when you're a youth minister, uh, you have to be a parent minister as well. Don't think that you're just there for the kids. You're there for the parents. Um, you know, it's, it's important one-two punch, and you've got to have your parents with you. If you are a parent, uh, I really, I, for some reason I looked at Cy when I said that. I mean, <laughs> Cy's not a parent yet. Um, if, you are, if you are a parent, uh, you know, not only for you, but for, for other kids. Be that example. Um, kids see that. Kids realize that. And that is really important that you don't abdicate that. And as ministers, it's really important that we don't allow parents to abdicate that. Uh, there are times, uh, Cody and I work through this all the time, but there are times when, when parents are involved. There are times when parents are not. Um, there are some, some things that sometimes kids open up more when parents aren't there, but there's a lot of ways that parents can be involved. And you've got to include parents as a part of your ministry in some way. Again, it's always, it's always uh, it, you have to use common sense and put logic and put yourself in whatever context you are. Uh, but I, I hear sometimes the, uh, the philosophy of, you know, well, the youth ministry is for the youth, parents stay away. And then I hear the philosophy of, well, we need to have parents. Everything should be, it's, as in most things, there's balance. Uh, so have that opportunity to communicate it to parents and parents, make sure that you are what you want your kids to be. Again, there's no silver bullet, but if you are not living the Christian life, I don't know why you would expect your kid to one day. Uh, that's just not something you can, and you have to realize that. Well, and I'll say this too. This goes along with not just like youth programs, but when you think about this concept of teaching teenagers or leading teenagers to be leaders, if you as the parent aren't showing leadership in your life, don't expect your kids to be leaders in theirs. I mean, I know that sounds kind of harsh, and I know that sounds kind of brutal, but it is the truth. So kids will spend about 85% of their time with you as parents, and they spend about 10% of time with us and 5% of time with their school friends and extracurriculars and stuff. So if you're not leading and being a leader in the church, you cannot and should not expect your teenager to be the leader that you're not. It's not going to happen. Um, and, and as the kids get older, um, it will become even more challenging. Um, you know, if kids aren't grown up in a culture in your family where they see you leading, seeing you active in church, seeing you involved, trying to be there when the doors are open, trying to put in your everything and live out who Jesus is, don't get mad at them when they try to get away from doing anything in the youth group because they want to go do something else with friends or just not go or whatever because they're not seeing the example out of you. So that, that's, if I could stress to you out of this list, which one is the most important? Parents, be the leaders that your kids need to see. Mm -hmm. Don't expect your youth minister to magically train your kid to be the best leader ever because it's not going to happen if, without your help. So you have to be. In. So the second one is this, uh, and, and we do this often. We're not perfect. Don't expect your kids to be perfect, and don't pretend like you're perfect. You know, I, I've been working, I think I'm up to 197 kids that I've graduated since I started ministry. And one of the things that is common that I see a lot with parents class after class after class is 
kids will come and talk to me or kids will come and talk to Keith or kids will come and talk to other people that I've worked with and they'll say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. And, and I'll always ask them, hey, have you talked to your parents about this? No, if I, if I talk to mom and dad about this, man, they would just, they would be so disappointed. They'd be so upset. They'd be so frustrated. You know, they, they would just never do that. What the kids don't realize most of the time is their parents probably did do that. But their parents have hit it well enough that their kids get this perception that, hey, my, my parents are perfect. Great leaders, and I, I, I love reading about leadership, great leaders are ones who are vulnerable to the mistakes and the imperfections who are willing to look at them head on and overcome it. One of the most powerful things your kids can see, the teenagers that you work with will see, is when you go through an imperfect, or an imperfect time, you make a mistake, and they see how you overcome it because you're teaching kids how to live faithfully to Jesus. If you just put on this persona or this facade that you're perfect, kids never get the opportunity to learn how to overcome imperfections. And that's valuable to kids. Look, kids are going to make a mistake. I was a teenager not that long ago, and I made a plethora of stupid choices after stupid choices. And there was this pressure that when I made a mistake, that the only thing that was going to happen when I talked to a responsible, adult, mature Christian that was important in my life, I thought if I tell them this, they're going to look down on me. But looking back at it, I wish I would have been smart enough to go talk to them because a lot of them would have gladly told me, hey, mistakes happen. Here's how I overcame it. Here's what I did to get through that difficult time and listen to the advice that they have. So don't, don't put on this perfect front that you're perfect. Your preachers aren't perfect. Your elders aren't perfect. Your youth ministers aren't perfect. Your parents aren't perfect. Your kids aren't perfect. As far as I remember in the text, there's only been one that's ever stepped foot on earth that's been perfect. That's correct. You remembered right. All right. Okay. So we have, to, we have to be very, very in tune with that, that it's okay to have imperfections. Show kids how to get through them. Don't hide them and mask them from your kids because then when they have an imperfection, they're in panic because they've never seen how to work through it. And I think looking back sometimes, I see it like in, in, in my age. I'm, I'm older than Cody, yes. if you didn't know that. Uh, Ten years older if you didn't know that. Well, you didn't have to point that out. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think I, I look around and... Of, of kids I grew up with and, and kids I went to school with and a lot of times, in, in the past sometimes, and I don't think it was done on purpose, I don't think it's done on purpose today, but there's been a perception that you gotta be perfect. Uh, and, and you know, once, once, you, once you're baptized, you gotta be perfect. And the reason I gotta be perfect is because everybody else is perfect because, you know, on the average Sunday morning, nobody else is going forward, so. They must all have it together, and uh, so I better have it together too, and it's, it's this masking thing, and we do a real disservice to ourselves. Um, you know, we're, we're told to confess our sins uh, to, to each other. We're told to, to, to open up and, and to realize that we're broken. We don't need to be Pharisees and look around and think, I've got it all together. I'm perfect. Um, that's, that's how we push kids away from the church. Because either they, when they make mistakes, they think, I'm not perfect anymore, that's not a place for me. Um, or they think, wait a second, you know, that, eventually that light bulb comes on, some sooner than others, and, and they realize, well, that's just a bunch of hypocrites. Why do I want to associate with it? So as parents especially, and that's again working with parents to, to help them realize, let your kids know when you fail. Be able to admit when you fail. Ask for forgiveness when you fail. Model what they need in their lives. And that all uh, comes through as, as far as not being perfect. So another part of that that's really important is three little words, I don't know. Okay? You don't know it all. You don't. Okay? Uh, Tim, maybe. No, <laughs> not, Tim doesn't. So nobody else in here does either. Okay? Um, but... You, you don't know it all, and yet, especially younger guys, look up here, uh, you know, not, not, age, not age discrimination or anything, I'm old too, okay? But younger guys, we're often very tempted to feel like we have to know all the answers, okay? Sometimes parents feel like they have to know all the answers. If par parents, the one thing I would say, the, the strongest points I've had with, with my kids, I, I've got a, a daughter who's a freshman at Free, that's a son who's a senior, and another one who's an eighth grader, is when I've said, I don't know, or I'm not, I'm not for sure on that. Let's study it together. Those are powerful words. And to say that to your youth group members, 
Uh, somebody asks a really good question in class, and sometimes it's, it's a, you feel like, oh, I don't know that, and so I feel somehow shame, like, like we should feel that, and so I've either got to ignore that question or just give some fluff, which kids know when we're giving fluff. Instead, just take the time and say, man, that's a really good question. I've got to study that some more. Let's all study that and talk about it next week. There's going to be a next week, right? You know, Sunday always comes every seven days, like Wednesday too. Like we have some flexibility when you're teaching youth and, and be real with them and be able to say, I don't know. Let's study that together. That's really important because it models, it models to them two things. One, they don't have to know it all, right? You, you have some kids that they, they don't want to put Christ on in baptism because they feel like they don't know enough. What? You don't know it all, right? I love that my 74-year-old dad who has dementia is still reading and studying, probably because half the time he forgets that he studied it the day before, but it's okay. He's still reading and studying. Um, and I love that. I absolutely love that. And I hope that I never stop studying. And I think sometimes when we come across as we know it all, honestly, if you ask some youth group kids about either their parents or their minister, and you say, do you think they study? They might say no, because they think we know it. And they don't realize that we're still learning and growing every day, and all the more they need to, and hopefully never stop. So I don't know, let's study it together, is a really powerful thing to be able to say to kids. Parents, um, when parents ask you a question, if you're going to be in ministry, um, sometimes it's okay to say, I don't know. Uh, I've had several parents in 10 years have asked me, hey, do you think my kid's going to be faithful through church? all through their college career. It's okay to say, I don't know. Um, but now I will say one thing that we, we can be... Just, just don't say, no way, man. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't say gonna, no way. That's gonna like, be try really to avoid that one. But That's... one of the things that I, I remember um, that, that stuck with me when working with kids and working through with teenagers with this concept of saying, I don't know, um, is be honest when you tell them, I don't know, I'll study it and get back with you. Because I have seen too many people who say, I don't know, I'll study it and get back with you, and then never get back with them. And then those kids will go out and do their own research. They'll go out and look at every commentator. They'll, they'll go out and pull up every Internet resource. And what will happen is if you are not willing to study it and teach kids, kids will educate themselves in some fashion. Could be right. Could be not right. Could be biblical. Could be horribly off-the-wall, opinionated garbage that's going to wreck their spiritual well-being. So don't just say, I don't know, let me study it and get back with you. Or don't just say, hey, I don't know, let's study it and get back with you. Be intentional and actually sit down and lead them to what they are trying to find, the answer that they need to see. Because if you just leave them wondering, I'm just telling you, look at the Jewish people in the Old Testament. When they were wandering around trying to figure it out, how well did that go? Not very good. Be intentional about your I don't knows, let's study it and get back to it. Don't leave them hanging. Uh, I've seen several people's faith wrecked spiritual havoc because nobody got back with them and they found out the answer on their own and they couldn't res resonate they couldn't determine what was truth and what was garbage whereas you have the experience of life you have the knowledge of life to actually walk them through and kind of sort through what's junk and what's biblical so I actually go back to them. number next and so, what, just real quick and that's also why it's so important not to give fluff uh, and, and or or the worst I think the worst thing for parents and educate your, your parents on this is to say, well, that's just the way it is. <laughs> like youth today, I mean, that's never been a great answer, but youth today, they, they can get the answer so quick to everything. They're used to that. YouTube, you know, Instagram it, uh, they, get, they get on and they can find it like that. Whether it's right or wrong, they can find it. And just to say, well, that's in there or that's what the preacher says, or that's what the Bible says when the Bible doesn't actually say that <laughs> word for word, like, like don't drink, uh, you know, don't take me out of context here, but I'm saying it, you know, well, the Bible, the Bible says that, right? Like, and so that takes a little bit more. You got to go down a road and lead them along to see, you know, the, the, why it's saying that rather than just, because then somebody else comes along and says, well, you know, it doesn't really say those words. And then they take them off in a different direction. And if you just gave them fluff, then they don't have anything to stand on. And that's completely biblical. Nobody's ever said, the Bible doesn't say, 
anything like that, right? The first sin in the garden. What does Satan say when he wrecks havoc on Adam and Eve? Did he say, you, he, he said one little phrase, literally that, that left. You just broke the stool. Wreaked havoc. There's a way. See, he gave me the wooden one, and he took the metal one, and I'm the fat guy. That's not fair. Uh, but Satan himself said, did he say this, and he questions Adam and Eve, and he said one little word, not. You surely will not, and he wreaked havoc on them. So don't do the same thing to your kids. Um, realize that their soul is on the line, and it's way more important than just kind of giving them an answer to blow them off. This really is a big deal. Number next, give God the glory in all things that you do. When you're working with teenagers... Um, especially if you are a youth minister, um, just remember you're not doing youth work. You're not trying to grow your numbers in the church just so you can say, hey, we have three vans worth of kids. You're saying, hey, I've brought 30 souls to the God of the universe. And to be honest with you, you're not really doing anything. You're just watering and throwing some seed and God's providing the increase. The glory doesn't go to us. It never was intended to go to us. It's never about us. It's always about God and what he's done. Because if you take God out of the equation, you take away Jesus Christ and the salvation that he provides through his blood, through his body, through his plan, through his universe, through his creation, and you put everything else that we've done in line, and, hey, I'm doing this, I'm ministering to kids. Uh, well, but if you don't have Jesus and you don't have a sacrifice for the sins, everything you're doing is useless. Therefore, you're really not doing anything. God's doing it all. The glory is always going to God. You know, it's really easy when you're working with teenagers to try to make results or show how successful, measure success on numbers. It's not always about numbers. It's about salvation of teenagers, faithful teenagers to God. And God gets the glory for that. And, and it's like, like Cody said, especially if you're in an area like the Nashville area, there's a lot of youth groups, right? If, if, I've, got a, if I've got a kid that uh, someone else can connect with better, you know, and, and, and he starts coming over here to Isaac, great. You know, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to call up Isaac, hey, I got a kid that's coming over there now, and, you know, I'm going to communicate. Uh, if I got a kid that, you know, is, ends up with Robbie Forrester or so, somebody else, and, and likewise, the same thing. Uh, communicate. Don't, don't see it as, a, as an ego thing. It's, it's kingdom work. That's really important for us to understand is that it's kingdom work. Um, but also, as you give the glory to God, then your parents and your kids are going to see that. And, and as parents, you need to make sure and do that and realize there's a lot of great things we can be doing, extracurriculars and things, if we're giving the glory to God, uh, wh whether it's, it's running or football or music or ballet or whatever it may be doing, why are you doing it? You're doing it to give God glory, you know, through the talents he's given you. And, and if you can work with your kids to see that, that there's purpose in everything you do because you're giving God the glory it can start to reshape some of how they're thinking about things. This is not my church life and my activity life. This is not my church life and my academic life. This is my life. And it's all giving glory to God in everything that I do. And that's important for kids to understand, for them to have purpose. Uh, so make sure and model that yourself. And in turn, they will catch on to that. When a kid gives you a compliment, glory to God. You know. Thank you. Glory to God. Like, just model it, and, and it's, it's, it's fun to watch kids repeat. Like, kids, kids repeat stuff, and all of a sudden you see them start doing some of the things that you're doing, so try and do good things, <laughs> you know? It's not so much fun when they copy some of the bad things you do. Because <laughs> they bad, will repeat that. We do bad <laughs> things, too. Um, next thing, uh, allow youth to question, and you've got to, you know, if, if, again, if you are a parent, allow your kids to, to question things without going, ah, whoa, wait, what's going on? Um, and, you know, back parents off the cliff, when, when, when you're a minister and some mom comes in and says, my son said this, or he was asking this, or he was, sometimes you've got to and be proactive with that. You know, tell parents up front. At, at our, when we have our annual parent meeting, I always try to tell parents, hey, let them ask questions and don't get crazy when they ask questions. Because if you get crazy when they ask the question, they're surely not going to come to you when they have the problem, like we were talking about earlier. Um, but if kids don't feel like they can ask questions, to, by the way, a lot of the same questions that we've gone through in our own lives. Is God real? You know, 
is, is this faith thing something, do I have faith? Do I believe Jesus is the Son of God? Do I, you know, if, if all of a sudden we're, you know, we're going through apologetics or a, a kid on his own, some, a teacher says something, and he's thinking about, man, do I, do I really believe that God is real? And, and he goes to mom and dad and say, hey, I don't know, if, is God real? If mom and dad freak out and be like, ah, yeah, and then all of a sudden, and, and they don't let them, they, 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 usually what happens is the kids, oh, oh, I shouldn't have asked that. And thereby thinking they shouldn't have asked it, they don't go on to find the answers they need for their faith. Sometimes those of us that have faith, the hardest thing to realize is other people don't. And so they've got to ask questions and go through and study and think about things that I've already come to an answer on. But if I don't let them go through the process, it's not going to be their faith. And that's really hard for parents sometimes. So parents, make sure you allow that. And in ministers, you got to talk to parents about letting them do that because it's, it's an important process. And you, you don't want them to then go through that process once they're up and gone. The best time for them to go through that process is when they're with us and when they're with their parents and when they're with their family. So if they ask a, a crazy question like that, you say, you know, that's a good question. Uh, what, you know, ask, turn around and ask them a question. I always tell my, my kids, ask a question when you're asked a question. But you know, what, have, what have you thought about that? What have you studied about that? And then see where it goes as, as a parent with that personal study with a kid. Um, that, that's important to allow them to question so that they can build. Because otherwise, there, there, there's nothing there for them to build a foundation on. And, and I, so I've always viewed leadership with kids uh, when it comes to building their faith in two ways. You have two concepts, I think, that are possible, whether as a parent, as a youth minister, as a minister, whatever it may be. You have one model where you are standing in front of a kid telling them, hey, come this direction, and pulling them towards it. That's one way you can lead kids. You can, with all of your strength and all your might, do your very best to pull kids in the direction that you feel they need to go. It's great until you're not there. What do you mean? You wake a kid up every Sunday for church. You get a kid ready every Wednesday night for Wednesday night Bible class. You make a kid get ready and go to every youth event. You make a kid do this, do this, and you pull them and pull them and pull them and pull them. And then whenever they go off to college and you're not there pulling them, you hope that for some reason they make the choice that they just keep going in that direction. That's one option. The option that I have personally enjoyed and I think is probably more successful is you get behind a kid and put your, your hand on that kid's shoulder and you lead them from behind. And as they're navigating through their faith and they come to those crossroads, okay, why is it that I need to get up every Sunday? You lead them and tell them and speak to them, hey, here's the reason why if I were in your shoes, I would choose this path because God is who God is. He deserves worship. He deserves us to be there. And you let them lead themselves and build their faith from behind, supporting them rather than pulling them. And then here's the great thing. When they get on their own, they never had anybody pulling them anyway. They were making those decisions and they think back, oh man, whenever I was going through this, they were leading me and they were talking me through these decisions that I need to make. And you are empowering that kid to take the action themselves rather than pulling them, hoping that it sticks. So we need to make sure that when kids are questioning things and building their faith, don't be the person who pulls and yanks and, and does all of the the harsh things that you can to get a kid to remain faithful, you lead behind, one step behind with your hand on your shoulder and guide them in wisdom and in heart and let them navigate and question and walk through and work through difficulty so that when they're on their own, they say, hey, I've had a, a guide my whole life and I'm ready to conquer this. And they will make those decisions the way that they need to be. And, so you need to make sure that you're doing that. And, and, and on that, you know, I stumbled into this but one of the best things I ever did, I think, with my kids, uh, you know, and they're still developing. You know, again, we don't have all the answers. There's no silver bullet. I don't know where they'll be in 10 years, uh, prayerful and hopeful. But one of the best things that I've done is something that I would have usually never done, but is sometimes we have four cars at the church building. Uh, you know, my kids, they drive themselves to church. I know there, there's some aspect of you think, oh, we're going to be a family on Sunday morning. We're all going to drive there together. 
But as that just kind of happened, because I'm a minister and sometimes I got to be there early and my wife's doing something else and they're coming from different places. And again, we're just all driving. And, and in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, four cars from Nolansville, we're paying the gas. This is ridiculous. <laughs> but at the same time, now, like, my kids, I don't, I don't even text them anymore. They just, they show up. They are used to driving this. I'm, I'm hopeful that as, as they continue to get older, that that's just something they're getting used to. It's not, hey, get in the car so mom and dad can take you to church. That's just a little thing, but I, I kind of stumbled into that one, and I, I think I've seen good things from it so far. But. Number next, uh, this one is crucial. If you're a youth minister, you're a parent, uh, you're a minister, uh, I think that this is probably one of the ones that will be beneficial. It doesn't matter where you're at. Um, I think this is one of the ones that definitely will cross over to, that, that you can utilize everywhere. Involve your kids, your teens, in the life of the church. We harp kids and we tell kids, hey, you're the future of the church. You're the future of the church. You're the future of the church. And we forget they're the church right now. Amen. Rather than saying, hey, whenever they're older, we'll utilize them as this. Look, let kids teach. Let kids lead singing. Let kids offer a Wednesday night devotional. And you say, well, maybe they're not the best speaker. Maybe they're not the best songwriter. Hey, I get it. They're serving God. Why would you discourage that? Plug them in. Find an area. Look, every Sunday morning in the Lord's Church, there is a need for men to pass out trays if your congregation is passing out trays for communion. Every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, there's needs for prayers, song leaders. There's Wednesday night devotional speakers. There's welcoming greeters. There are people who literally, there, there are millions of jobs that teenagers are highly capable and confident and we should be just helping and encouraging them to be a part of. And we just don't because we convince ourselves that as they mature, we'll start using them. Why not start using them now and let them just become that much better as they get older? Uh, one of the things that happens at Concord Road, and I love this, uh, we have a, a couple, Mac and Kelly Alsop, and they are over our senior servants at church. One of the things that they do with our teenagers is when it's raining, they have a group of men who go get there early, they grab umbrellas, and they escort the older members inside the building with an umbrella. That's an easy job for a teenager, right? Passing out a tree, easiest job on the face of the planet. We, we do a thing called Children's Bible Hour during worship on Sunday mornings for the little, little kids during the sermon that we give them a lesson that's geared to their level of learning for the little, little kids. I utilize our teenage girls to help me and my wife when we do Children's Bible Hour to help teach and wrangle the kids, do crafts with those kids, vacation Bible school. You can use them like we do. We use them as line leaders. They march those little kids around the entire building to all their different activities. They are completely capable. They just need somebody to ask. And we sometimes just simply don't ask just because we think, oh, well, we'll, well, when they get older, we'll use them. So we need to make sure that we are using them in the church. And what you are doing, yes, it may be a small, easy job, but you are showing them you have a part in the body of Christ in our congregation. Mr. Bill? Absolutely. Yeah, I think and it's, it's important. Our, our next point kind of goes along with this, but it's vocalizing the idea of, of that. And uh, semantics do make a difference. And I know when people say they're the future of the church, people are well-intentioned in that. But it's one of those things that now that I've wrapped my mind around that, when I hear that, I cringe at it because I said, no, they are the church. Like, like they are a part of it. Um, and we've, we've, got, we've got to bring them into it. Uh, another thing that we do that I'll throw there out there as an idea, and this is my, my background. I just, I became a youth minister. I'm, I'm older than him, but he has more ministry experience than I do. Uh, I, I started youth ministry late. I started out, my background is education, um, lesson plans and all that type of stuff. I think it's really important for our females especially. They're dealing with a lot of pressures from the world. A lot of people that say, you know, hey, you know, the Church of Christ, oh, that's the that's the group that keeps women down or that's the, they don't respect women or whatever it may be said. Um, it's important for our young ladies to have a lot of opportunities too. Uh, in, in the, we take one quarter a year where we place our young ladies kind of like 
uh, student teachers into our education program. And they go in and they observe for about four weeks and then they co-teach for about four weeks and then they uh, <laughs> teach for about five weeks because, you know, we got to have 13 weeks. That's <laughs> how we do it. Uh, and so that's why all the books have 13 chapters. Uh, and so, you know, it's important to, to, to do things like that with our ladies. And I had, I had some pushback at first from some, some parents. And they said, no, no, I want my daughter in class. I don't want her, you know, teaching. And I, I walked them through the fact that uh, anyone who teaches will tell you, you learn more when you teach. You just do. Because you study twice as hard and you use half the material. It's, it's just it's kind of like the, the secret of teaching, right? You, you, know, you know, most teachers get to the end of class and go, oh, it's, I had more, but, you know, see you next week. Uh, I won't ever talk about this. Uh, so, um, but giving our kids opportunities, and we, we have our guys do that too. We have our guys teach. Uh, when, when we go out uh, on our mission trip, a lot, one of the things we do is we teach all the kids' classes uh, out on the Navajo Res for their family Bible camp. Uh, but that comes with, we, we don't, don't just show up. Uh, you know, we meet every month, and they have lesson plans, and they, like, line those lessons, and they learn how to develop a lesson plan, like, What's going to be my point? What's going to be my back scripture? What's going to be my activity? What's, what do I want the kids to learn out of this? And you go through that and work, and they learn just as much from that. But they learn how to be part of the church. And then one of the things I encourage with our college kids, hey, have you placed membership yet? Have you found a home congregation yet? Have you found a home? You know, I'm always asking, where are you worshiping? You know, I want you to visit around, but eventually I want you to settle in because then, hey, are you teaching a class yet? Have you volunteered to teach a class? Like, get involved because just, I mean, being very simplistic in nature, why do people stay faithful? Because they get involved. People that don't get involved, it's a lot easier to fall away. It's a lot easier to feel like no one would miss me if I left. Well, part of that is because you've never inserted yourself and become a part so do that. And so I think if we teach our kids how to do that when they're younger and we vocalize it and we, we say, hey, you need about, we expect you to be involved. Here's how you can be involved. Uh, you know, and not every kid wants to get up and up in front and do something. And, you know, we get put, we put way too much, you know, importance on what I call microphone time. Uh, but you got kids that can work in the audio booth, kids that work in the video booth. You know, go to your Go to your video guys or your audio guys, and we, you know, we all have them now after COVID, right? We learn why that's actually important now. Everybody's on the same page. And, uh, but say, hey, I got a, a young man that I'd really like him to work with you and, and be in there because that's how I think he could serve. Um, you know, I got you know, this or that, and, and you throw that out there and give them opportunities, vocalize it, and make sure they understand. Well, and, and with that vocalizing to your teenagers, you create a culture in your kids when they constantly hear, so consciously, when you're all of the time talking about leadership, 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 that will ingrain in kids' head. And there's this expectation that, hey, they see something in us that they believe is potential for me to lead in an area because they keep talking about it. Uh, one of the things that, that I use, so when I came to Concord Road a year, almost a year and a half ago, um, is I changed our directory to what's called Instant Church Directory. It's a great app. If you don't know what it is, you can ask me about it. It's phenomenal. Uh, it will change the way that you do visitation, make phone calls, all that. But in order to do Instant Church Directory, you have to um, be able to download an app on your phone, log in on that app, and once you get that done, it is the most easy, navigatable thing. And what I started doing is uh, when people would come up to me and say, hey, I'm having trouble getting this on my phone. Could you help me? I said, yeah, I would love to. But there's this young person who is so good with technology. Have you thought about asking him? And what you find out is you'll see an older member of the church sitting down with a teenager in the church. Teenagers got their phone. And then there's this 20 minute conversation on how things work that a teenager is actually teaching an older person. I think it took Bill 30 minutes. <laughs> but, but you have this, this leadership capacity that you've handed off to a kid that otherwise they wouldn't have had if I'd have just did it myself. Sometimes the best thing that you can do to kind of vocalize and show kids how to lead is simply just don't choose to do things and let kids be the ones to do it, and you just kind of supervise and help them do it. You lead them from behind. Hey, could I do that? Yeah, I could do that easily. In five minutes, I could set your iPhone up, but so could that kid. So why not utilize them and vocalize them and let them feel that they're a leader? That's so, so crucial for kids. Number next. Um, 
there is a book called Sticky Faith. If you haven't read it and you plan on working with teenagers, I'll just encourage you, go grab that book, go read through it, because what you'll find is in their research, there is a key that is tremendously beneficial to keeping kids faithful through college. And this is what they say. Seven intergenerational relationships is the key to keeping kids faithful through college. So if you can connect your teenagers, if you can lead them to build seven meaningful intergenerational relationships with members at church, they are highly, 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 highly going to have a better chance of remaining faithful through college. What that looks like may be totally different where you're from or where I'm from. When I was in Florence, we had Tyson Chicken that donated 13 semi-trucks full of raw chickens, frozen chickens. And we utilized those raw chickens as a way to connect teenagers with other members of the church. Here's what I mean. I had three guys who were in their 70s, two guys who were in their 50s, myself and another youth minister in the area who were both in our 30s, and then two guys who were in their 20s. Every Friday night, we would meet together at this barn, and we would smoke 200 pounds of chicken all night long. And the stories that you would hear between these group of older men down to the, all the way to myself and a couple of younger that these teenagers got to hear, they would laugh, they would hear stories of heartbreak, they would hear stories of how people overcome cancer, losing a spouse, and they built these relationships. To this day, Friday nights, those same teenagers are still smoking chicken for the community with these older men. All of them have graduated college and have their own kids. All of them are remain faithful through college. You find whatever avenue in your church it may look like, it may look totally different than what we have, but you find a way to connect kids at least to seven other adults. It may be fishing. It may be sports. I know Brother Bill, he does a great job of working with some of our young people when it comes to golf. He loves golf. Some of our kids love golf. Their youth ministers are terrible at golf. Bill is not terrible at golf. So they're just between the three of us, that's three intergenerational relationships that they've already connected out of seven. You add their parents in, that's another one. You add our preacher in, that's another one. You add an elder in the mix, that's another one. It's really not hard to connect kids to seven different intergenerational people because we have way more in common than we realize. We just don't simply get to know each other. But you as a minister or as a parent, you foster that. You provide those kids opportunities to make those relationship connections, whether that's you invite an older member or a younger member who's the unprofessional to eat dinner with your family at your table. Because when you can successfully get seven relationships, you just increase that kid's chance of staying faithful through college astronomically. And it's worth, I mean, if I were to ask any parent, is it worth your kid being faithful? Absolutely it is. Mm -hmm. And that's where ministers, it, this seems like easy, but you've got to get to know your congregation. You know your kids. I hope you know your kids. <laughs> uh, but you've got to get to know your congregation. You've got to know. Who, who is the, you know, you got kids that do golf. Who's the golf? You know, you got kids who are runners. Who used to run? You got kids who uh, like auto mechanics. Who, who know something about auto mechanics? You got kids who, uh, you know, they're interested in, in investing. Oh, like, who's the financial planner that you can hook them up with? Like, uh, find ways to get them connected so it's not awkward. Because we all, we all, it's easy to make the call from the podium and be like, hey, uh, we'd really like some volunteers to get involved in the youth program. If you'd like to, please see me after class. Nobody ever sees you because uh, everybody thinks somebody else will do it. But you go to somebody and you say, hey, listen, I know that you love photography. I've got an up-and-coming eighth grader who is taking photography next year in high school, and they really want to learn more about it. Could you please go and talk to them? That person, almost all the time we'll go talk to that kid. Uh, because you, you, you personally made the ask and you made a connection uh, and you've helped foster that. That's really important. Uh, another thing, and we're, uh, we're getting close to we're time, close. Yeah, uh, is we, we make staying faithful really complicated sometimes. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Study, pray, and fellowship. Study, pray, and fellowship. As, as your kids are getting older, whether they're your personal kids or their kids in your church or their kids in your youth group, um, work with them. The, the, the number one thing that I do as our kids transition from high school into college is I text them all the time, remind them I'm praying for them, and I ask them what they're studying. And again, like I said earlier, I, I really 
like go at I don't I'm not annoying right you don't you know don't <laughs> beat their door down and but I I try to hold them accountable and that they know I'm gonna ask hey where are you worshiping right and and I don't just all of a sudden ask I like as they're seniors I start talking to them about hey oh hey yeah you're so you're going to uh, you know you're going to UNA or you're going to University of Huntsville or you're going to Freed or you're going to Harding or you're going to Alabama. Have you thought about where you're going to worship? You know, hey, here's, here's a couple good places. Um, you know, make sure you're going to Alabama. Make sure you're looking for Tide for Christ. You're going to, you know, UT Chattanooga. Make sure you look in to, you know, the different groups and things. And then when you ask in the fall, it's not awkward because you've already been talking about it with them. And you say, hey, wh- where did you end up placing membership? Well, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of looking around. Like, that's what you get at first. And then he's, you know, he's like, well, hey, that, that's, that's great. I'm glad you're looking around. I, ho- I hope you can zone in on something and find something. Because fellowship is so important to remaining faithful. They've got a fellowship. That, that's, God designed it that way. Like, that's not, that's not me. That's, that's God putting it there for us and placing it there for us. And sometimes, though, we just need to make sure and reach out and help kids make those connections. And I'm, I'm going to be really brief on that. Uh, one of my favorite things that I heard one time is, why don't we see church disfellowship very often much anymore? Because we don't have fellowship to disfellowship. And that's, that's a true statement. I remember when I was a kid, I remember seeing three people disfellowshipped. I remember elders standing up with tears in their eyes, making this decision that, hey, they're, we're losing a part of our family because they're choosing to be unfaithful. We don't really see that anymore. The reason we don't see that is because we probably don't have the deep connected relationships like we have in times past in the church. So keep it simple, but make sure that you are keeping accountable to one another in the church family. Um, uh, number next, because we're running out of time, so I'm going to speed this up. This is one that is definitely uh, can be used anywhere you are. Um, be adaptable. Be adaptable. When you're leading teenagers, what you will find is there are no two teenagers who are the same. Um, if you're a parent who has multi-kids, you can raise both of your kids the exact same, and they're still going to turn out different, the two different kids, right? Why is that? We're all built and created and knit together differently. You have to be adaptable to work with teenagers. Here's the thing. There are a lot of things that I go and I support and I'm a part of that I have zero interest and zero care on the face of the planet to ever be a part of. I'll give you an example. When I was in Florence, I had a young uh, lady that was in my youth group, sweetest kid ever, highly talented with music. She could sing. She did all of the, the plays. She did all that. Me, I don't sing. I don't wear makeup. I don't do plays. That's like the three no's for me. Uh, I went to a play one time, and I didn't realize this. I get there, and I'm sitting beside her father, and he's asleep, snoring, and this play is in another language. And she still to this day comes up to me and says, hey, I appreciate you taking the time out of coming to something you don't care about. But it's because I chose to be adaptable. I have other kids who are sports kids. I'll go watch them participate in their volleyball. I have kids who don't do any of those, and they sit at home and they play video games. And I'll go hang out with them in their environment, in their house, And I try to tailor my style, my ministry, my leadership of those teenagers. I adapt it to match teenagers that I'm working with. There's no one fits all for kids. You know that. I know that. That's not profound. You have to learn your kid, figure out what is successful, what is valuable to that kid, what their interests are, what their passion is, and then immerse yourself into their environment. Adapt yourself to lead a kid like that. And it's not something that's unbiblical, right? What did Paul say? I've become all things to all people that he might do what? Save. Save. Be adaptable. Lead teenagers require, leading teenagers rather requires you to be adaptable. Do things that you don't enjoy and do it with a smile on your face because you love the person doing it. If you're not adaptable, that's when you start seeing kids who just kind of are standoffish and they say, hey, he don't really give me any effort, energy, time. He doesn't even try with me. And you know what they do? They give you the same cold shoulder that you're giving them. So be adaptable. Yeah. Well, and that's just, you know, it's, we're out of time. But I hope maybe you picked up one, one or two nuggets today. Uh, if, uh, you know, feel free to text either one of us or if you have questions or anything. But uh, the last thing I'll just end with is learn from everybody around you. It's important uh, because, again, there are no... Uh, necessarily hard, fast, right or wrongs. There's no magic bullets, uh, but we're all in this together. We all fail. We all make mistakes. And the more we can learn from one another, the better we can get through each and every day as we walk the Christian, Christian race. So 
Um, thanks so much for coming. Let's close in a prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity we have to get together and, and to talk about these things. We pray that all the sessions that uh, we're going to this week or we're able to use things that we hear to grow closer to you and be a light for those around us. Please work through us in amazing ways where we can give you the glory because we know we couldn't do it by ourselves. But we thank you for where you've put us in the kingdom and we pray that you help us to always work for that kingdom and for you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.